This is Sunshine for the Soul with Michael Kaiser from Sylacauga Church of Christ. Hello, I'm Michael Kaiser, and again, it's a pleasure to welcome you to another program of Sunshine for the Soul, brought to you by the Sylacauga Church of Christ here in Sylacauga, Alabama. I'm the minister of the church, and we always count a privilege and a pleasure to have this opportunity to come your way and to share this time with you and your family as we study together from the Word of God. For a few moments today, I want to think with you upon the topic, the value of Bible study. Bible study is what we're engaged in in this very program. Is there any value to this, the value of Bible study? In the book of 2 Timothy, in chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, the Apostle Paul was writing another preacher, a young evangelist by the name of Timothy. And he said to that man, from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And so we find that Timothy was one who knew the scriptures. Now he told Timothy also, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He also would understand that he's saying to him, give diligence to show yourself to be a good servant of the Lord, handling aright what the word of God has to say. It becomes my duty and responsibility as a preacher of the gospel to handle aright God's word. Indeed, my friends, I do not want the anathema of God resting upon me because I've mishandled God's precious gospel, the good news of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we're talking about the value of Bible study today. Jesus told Satan when he was tempted, Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We all know that physical food is necessary for a physical life. But there's more to us than just the idea we have physical life. We understand that man also has a spiritual side to him. And for that reason, Jesus said we must live by what the Word of God also has to say to us. And so we look for physical bread to sustain our physical life. We look for this spiritual bread, the Word of God, to sustain our spiritual life. Now in the book of 2 Corinthians, in chapter 4, the Apostle Paul wrote these things about man. He said to us in verse 16, For which cause we faint not, but though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Well, there we become acquainted with the fact that man has not only his physical body, but also there is the inner man. And we're concerned about the feeding of the inner man. And that's the reason why we want to encourage the study of God's Word. Jesus also said something like this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Fear not him that is able to kill the body, and after that has nothing he can do unto you. But rather fear him that is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Now the Lord did not teach annihilation. But he did teach us that we're more than just a physical body. There's a spiritual side to man as well. And because of that we're concerned with feeding that spiritual man. And therefore the value of studying what God's word has to say. You know the Bible is the greatest book in all the world. In fact, it's the only book that we un understand that answers man's grave questions. Man's uh, old questions, like, who am I? Where did I come from? What am I doing here? Where am I going? It is the Bible that supplies for us the answer to those questions. And so, therefore, we give attention now to what the Bible has to say as we emphasize our need to even study the Bible. Now, in the passage we noted just a moment ago from 2 Timothy chapter 3, I want to again look at that passage. Paul tells Timothy, from a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures. There we find he used the expression, the Holy Scriptures. We could translate that like the sacred writings. In other words, these are not profane things. These are the sacred things. These are not things that pertain to man's physical well-being, but to man's spiritual well-being. These are things that man needs to know. And he says, Timothy, from a child, you've known these things, these sacred writings. Now, we understand we need to guard against abuse when it comes to those things that are sacred. And so, therefore, the Word of God is something that is uh, necessary for our well-being. Oftentimes, we find folks, the only time they're acquainted with the Bible is when they place their hand on it in the courtroom and give an oath of some kind. Or it could be that somebody says, I can prove anything by the Bible, and therefore they pick up the Bible and they turn to some passage of Scripture to prove some point they have to make. And so they misuse what the Bible has to say. Oftentimes we find their folks are satisfied with something the Word of God is paraphrased to say. And sometimes those paraphrases are quite different than what the Word of God really means. And of course there are always those people who put their trust in the annotations they find in some study of the Bible instead of actually the text of the Bible. 
Well, my friends, the Bible is a living message. The Word of God is living and active, the Hebrew writers wrote, and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so the first thing for consideration would have to be this, that we're looking at sacred writings, not profane words, but sacred words. The next thing we found that Paul said to Timothy was this, that the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, is given by the inspiration of God. Let's examine the word inspiration for just a moment. That word's a word which means God breathe. In other words, the Bible, these sacred writings, these scriptures proceeded from God. They're from God. They're God's word. And so they're God breathe. And therefore, by these things, we know the divine mind of God. Now, I don't know your mind except you tell me what's on your mind. You don't know my mind unless I tell you what's on my mind. Nobody knows the mind of God unless God tells us what's on his mind. And the scriptures reveal to us the mind of God about those things we need to know that pertain to man's spiritual and eternal well-being. Oftentimes folks come along and they will say something like this, Well, I thought, preacher, I thought this or I thought that. As if their thinking about matters is something superior to God's thoughts about matters. Now, Isaiah the prophet said to us, Now, the Lord's thoughts are not our thoughts, as the heavens are higher than the earth. So are God's thoughts higher than man's thoughts. God's wisdom is higher than man's wisdom. And so we cannot go around saying, I think about matters, religiously speaking. Here's what I believe about a matter. Because our thoughts don't count. Our thoughts are not the will of God. Our thoughts are not the mind of God. Our thoughts are our mind, not God's mind. And so let's pay attention to what the mind of God has to say to us. You recall the Saul of Tarsus thought he ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So he persecuted Christians. That's what he thought he ought to do, but he was wrong in that matter. You remember that Naaman, the man of the Old Testament, thought that Elijah, Elisha the prophet should come out and say something to him, some great thing to him, and wave his hands over him, do something, and instead uh, Elisha the prophet told him something different what he thought about matters. He had to learn that his thoughts did not count. It was the prophet of God, what he had to say. Those were the thoughts to be considered. Now, he said, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Sometimes the question is raised, can children really learn what the Word of God has to say? When I take my child to Sunday school, is it worthwhile for them? Well, it's worthwhile for them if the Sunday school teacher is teaching them what the Bible has to say. From a child, Timothy, you've known the Holy Scriptures. Now, he had a good grandmother. He had a good mother. His grandmother and his mother made sure that the principles of God's Word were instilled in young Timothy's heart from childhood. He knew those things. Now, some think we cannot teach children what the Bible has to say. But from a childhood, he knew those things. And it's our role as parents and our role as grandparents to make sure our children and our grandchildren understand the sacred writings. They can, we can teach them the sacred writings. We can explain those things to them. Now, other people have known what the Word of God had to say. Paul said regarding some, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and they searched the Scriptures. The Lord raised us in mind whether the things preached to them were so. They could know what the Word of God had to say. Now, we find Paul said in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, the things written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. How can we learn something if it's impossible for us to know it? Now, sometimes folks are discouraged by even what's called the clergy, from the reading of the Bible. is that the only folks who understood the Bible are those who constitute what is called the clergy. My friends, that is a false idea indeed. Indeed, you as a person, an individual, you can know what the Scriptures have to say and understand what the Scriptures have to say. In fact, on one occasion, Jesus told some people, search the Scriptures. From them you think you have eternal life, and these are they that testify of me. Why would the Lord tell people to search the Scriptures if they could not understand what the Scriptures had to say? Why would we be told the Scriptures for our learning if we cannot learn what the Word of God has to say? And so Paul told Timothy, from a child you have known these things. And also he said these things are things that make you wise unto salvation. Wise unto salvation. Well, how do they make us wise unto salvation? Well, indeed the Word of God shows us the need we have to be saved. For after all, the Word of God points out to us the great truth that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We find that uh, there are cases in the Scriptures where people have their sin pointed out to them. We've, in Acts chapter 2, on the great day of Pentecost, when the first gospel sermon was preached, the preaching of the Apostle Peter pricked their heart, convicted them. 
And when they were convicted, my friends, they then raised the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? But the preaching convicted them of their sins. The Word of God still convicts people of their sins. And so we look at this matter, it makes us wise unto salvation, how to be saved from our past sins and how to stay saved in the service of the Lord. But also he said, not only did it make you wise unto salvation, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Now we understand that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. There are many ways that you and I might hear the Word of God. You might be saying, I'm listening to the Word of God being preached. I'm hearing what the Word of God has to say. Well, indeed, my friends, that can produce faith. It could be that you're reading what the Word of God has to say. Maybe you're listening to what the Word of God has to say. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. When the Apostle John was bringing his great gospel to a close, he said this in John chapter 20, the gospel of John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Many other signs true to Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Written for what purpose? Well, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And John said, I wrote this gospel to produce faith in your hearts regarding Jesus Christ, that He is the Son of God. And so the Word of God produces faith. That's the importance of the Word of God. Now, when the Lord Jesus Christ came back from the dead, He appeared unto some of His disciples, and He related them things that the Old Testament prophets had to say. And he pointed out to them that he was the fulfillment of what the prophets had to say. They could know those things. Now, we need to know about Jesus for this reason. He's the only Savior of mankind, the only Savior. We need to have faith in him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by me. And also we find in John chapter 14, verse 6, that statement being made. But also in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, the apostle Peter declared, and neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none of the name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only Savior, and the Word of God will produce faith in Him as the Son of God. That's one of the reasons why we study the Scriptures. They're sacred. We also know they're given by inspiration. They reveal to us the mind of God. We can know the Scriptures, and the Scriptures are going to produce faith that makes us wise unto salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. But also we find the Apostle Paul said to us that the Scripture is profitable for us, profitable for doctrine, for proof, correction, for instruction, and righteousness. What do you mean it's profitable for us you know, as far as uh, doctrine be concerned? Well, the word doctrine there means teaching. Therefore, we turn to the Word of God for teaching, bring about conviction on our part and rebuke on our part and restore us to a proper a place where we ought to be with the instruction in righteousness. Now, let me encourage you as a parent. It is your responsibility as a parent to bring your child up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Therefore, it's very important for you as a parent to know what the Scriptures have to say. Now, your children, as we've already pointed out, can learn the Scriptures. They can know the Scriptures. But it's your responsibility as a parent to make sure they understand what God's Word has to say that you bring them up to the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You can't do that, my friends, by ignoring the child's spiritual well-being. And most of the time when children's spiritual well-being is being ignored, it's because the parents would uh, ignore their own spiritual well-being. So are you paying attention to your spiritual need? Are you passing that information on to your children? Now, remember this. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Live soberly, righteously, and godly. Now, the grace of God that brings salvation appeared to us. Now, that's talking about the gospel message. It teaches us just exactly how to live. Now, it makes the man of God perfect through the furnishing him unto all good works. Sometimes people misunderstand that King James word, perfect, and they think maybe that word is denoting the idea that's going to make me sinless. Well, none of us can ever claim to be sinless. It may be that your mother-in-law made that claim, but you cannot make that claim, and she should have made that claim for herself. After all, my friends, all of us are guilty of sin. Paul said, we're all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And even the Christian is instructed as to what to do if he finds sin in his heart and life, how to repent of it, confess it before God, and, of course, 
have the forgiveness of the Lord. And so therefore it is something that is important for us, the Word of God, to make us perfect, to cause us to be complete. That's the meaning of that word, to cause us to be complete. Now, all of us should, my friends, desire to be complete in the sight of the Lord. And to be complete in the sight of the Lord means we're spiritually mature. In other words, we're being led to practical, everyday living that's pleasing unto the Lord. And so there are some things, a sevenfold matter, of what the Word of God would do for us, what the Word of God is to us. It's the holy sacred writings given by inspiration, revealing to us the mind of God, something that we can know, and as we know it, it makes us wise in the salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. And my friend, it helps us to be uh, knowledgeable of these matters, that we might grow in grace and knowledge, and thus be spiritually mature. Now, there's a warning against ignorance in God's Word, a warning against ignorance. A couple of passages come to mind. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 32, the prophet of old declared, O Lord, I know the way is not in man. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Now, in the old King James translation, we find the Apostle Paul saying this on more than one occasion, I would not have you to be ignorant. Well, what does he mean by that? In other words, I would not you to be without the information you need to have. I would not want you to be without the knowledge you need to possess. I don't want you to be in that condition. You see, ignorance is a very dangerous thing, my friends, very dangerous things. There is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And so what's not in our way to direct our own path, we're going to walk. You and I might chart a course, but that'd be the wrong course. We go in the wrong direction, simply because we do not know what the Word of God has to say. Now think about what ignorance has done to others in times past. In the book of Hosea, Hosea the prophet declared regarding Israel the long ago, my people have perished for the lack of knowledge. Because of their ignorance of God's will, they destroyed themselves. We find also that it was because of ignorance that Jews crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. It was because of ignorance on their part. Now also we know this, that it took the Gentile people down a dark road. Their understanding was darkened. They were ignorant of things that pertain to the righteousness of God. And therefore they walked the wrong path. So in the ignorance of God's word is a very dangerous thing. Now look at what ignorance can do to a person. We find in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming one day in flaming fire to take vengeance on them that know not God and have obeyed not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They know not God. And I want to close our program today with looking at Psalm chapter 1 again. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the sea of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf off shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. But the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. And therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Folks, my friends, who know the way of the Lord are going to be saved if they follow what God's Word has to say to them. We sing that song, How Precious Is the Book Divine by Inspiration Given. Light my life, its precepts shine to guide my soul to heaven. We need to know the Word of God. We need to follow the Word of God. God's Word, my friend, is the lamp to our feet and the light to our pathway. And I would commend you to God and the word of His grace is the only thing that can build you up and give you inheritance among them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so today we've talked about the value of you studying your Bible. I hope we've encouraged you to, to get down your Bible and to study it every day. It's been our pleasure to be with you. We welcome you to our service at the church here in Sylacauga every Sunday at 945 Sunday School, 1045 our morning worship hour, and again on Sunday evening at 6 o'clock p.m. Thank you for viewing this program today. We hope you'll come back the next time we come your way. We bid you very pleasant. Good day.